while we're waiting, you can uh, take a look at the control panel and make sure you know where the Q&A is. So as we're going through our session today and you are thinking of questions, you can put them in the Q&A. That's where we'll be pulling uh, questions at the end of the session when we take questions from the audience. Okay, I think we're gonna get started. Welcome, my name is Audrey Wenning and I am the Director of Transportation for the Metropolitan Planning Council. We're so glad you're here today. MPC is an 85-year-old nonprofit organization that advocates for a more sustainable, prosperous, equitable, and engaged region. Today, we're here to talk about viewing transportation through the lens of equity. First, I'll go over some logistical de details. We wanted to let you know that we are recording this webinar and we will share the recording via email, follow up to registrants and, and on our website and our YouTube channel. Please use the Q&A box to sub Submit questions, uh, not the chat box. We'll be pulling questions from the Q&A box at the end when we take questions from the, the audience. The event is being offered with closed captions, so please check on your toolbar for settings to use the cool closed captions. When MPC developed our cost of segregation study in 2017, we define the cost to the region of living so separately by race and income in terms of lost income, unrealized education, and lost lives due to violence. In the follow-up report, Our Equitable Future, we recommended a series of next steps for how to improve the situation in our region. The research we're sharing with you today was defined in the Our Equitable Future report, and we're pleased to share the results for the first time today. Inferior transportation outcomes in our region's black and brown communities are the result of decades of discriminatory land use and transportation planning and policy decisions. These have left many black and brown residents living in areas that are farther from key destinations with fewer amenities in their neighborhoods. Because most of America's communities have been developed so that housing is located a significant distance from jobs, stores and medical care, Transportation needs to cover long distances and most destinations are only accessible by car. In the greater Chicago region, communities where black residents are the largest racial group experience the longest commute times. Consistently, Chicago ranks among America's most segregated regions. As many US metropolitan areas, as in the case of many US metropolitan areas, historical and ongoing systemic racism has blurred the lines between racial and economic segregation. Today, Chicago's poorest residents are disproportionately people of color living in communities of concentrated poverty. To rectify current inequities, which are a legacy of many years of cumulative decisions, planners must work proactively to improve communities that have historically experienced disinvestment and negative impacts. We must ensure that future investments are strategically targeted to offer greater benefits to marginalized groups who need more mitigate the effects of past discrimination and improve quality of life. It's with this framing that we enter into the conversation. We are so pleased to be here having this discussion and sharing these three new important pieces of research. Before we go any further, I'd like to thank the core team that has worked on this research over the past two years. Obai Reed of Equiticity, Kate Lowe of the University of Illinois, Chicago, and she'll be presenting today. Jesus Barajas of the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, Augustina Kropp, who was a research assistant at MPC uh, and had a lead role in the equity performance measures and I believe is joining from her home country of Argentina today, uh, and Jeremy Glover of MPC. We also want to give a hearty thank you and acknowledgement to the Chicago Community Trust, which funded this research. Now we will introduce our distinguished panel. While their biographical information is up on the screen, I'll let each panelist briefly introduce themselves and talk about how their work intersects with transportation equity. Good morning. Um, my name is Jackie Grimshaw. I'm from the Center for Neighborhood Technology. Um, I've been with the center for over 30 years and I originally started the transportation practice at CNT. 
Um, throughout my time there and throughout the history of CNT, we have always been focused on equity. In fact, our mission is making urban living uh, sustainable and equitable for low and moderate income folks. And so uh, I will today talk about a coalition we've created around equity as we get into the program. Thanks a lot. And I'll be talking to you later. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ron Hearns. I work for KRA. I'm the director of Midwest Workforce Operations. Um, we operate the West Side American Job Center uh, and the Chatham Center, uh, which is located at 630 East 79th Street. Um, we provide Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act services uh, for low-income adults, dislocated workers, and opportunity youth between the ages of 18 and 24. Um, we provide employment and we pr provide training. A large percentage of our uh, funding is devoted to transportation. Um, we provide bus passes and we uh, also provide uh, gas cards. Uh, the bus passes allow our customers to access employment and training. And uh, once they start employment after the first two weeks, uh, we provide uh, bus passes so that they can continue uh, making it to work. Uh, and also it helps them until their first two weeks are complete and they receive their first paycheck. Uh, that is uh, a goal of our funder, the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership. And I'll go into a little more detail during the question and answer session. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Chelsea Corrin and I recently graduated from UIC with a master's degree in urban planning and policy. Um, and now I'm a project coordinator on the Building Healthy Communities team at Northern Illinois Food Bank. Um, I became involved in this transportation equity research about a year ago, um, uh, not with a ton of background knowledge of or experience working on transportation issues, um, but as someone who really believes in the power of qualitative research uh, and of centering community voices in academic and policy discussions uh, on issues like mobility justice. Um, so over the past year, I've had the privilege of listening to many of these voices through our focus groups, uh, and I've learned a great deal about how people make adaptations to overcome transportation barriers um, and how transportation in intersects with so many um, other aspects of people's lives. So I'm very excited to share what we've learned with you all today. Hi, my name is Kate Lowe. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Urban Planning and Policy at the University of Illinois at Chicago. So all of my work has really focused on questions of transportation. I look at how programs, policies, stakeholders all together interact to shape the outcomes. I've always been motivated by questions of racial and income equity. I've done a lot on transit investments. And I've also done a lot of research like the work we'll talk about today that really tries to center the lived experiences of those experiencing structural inequalities and inequities and how this shapes transportation. So with that note, I'd actually uh, like to transition into talking about the studies that we did. Uh, Chelsea and I will both be presenting on the work we did in partnership with Equiticity and MPC. We'll talk about two related studies, community in context, which I'll discuss, and mobility in and beyond communities. They're both qualitative research projects to understand mobility justice. So I, I'll talk briefly about the motivation for doing this work. Then I'll talk ever so briefly about the Chicago context. Audrey already gave us a taste of that. Then I'll talk about our findings from our focus groups with job seekers and coaches. Then I'll pass off the presentation to Chelsea, who will be talking about our community-based focus groups and some concluding thoughts. 
Uh, so our motivation um, is that we have really, really powerful tools like this one that I've displayed. It's actually one of my favorites. They powerfully and quickly visualize quantitative information on transportation inequities. I've included this map that shows the limited job accessibility on the south side and especially the far south side of Chicago. However, we don't know if these quantitative tools tells the full story of what it's like to experience transportation struggles, especially from the perspective of brown and black workers and residents. So in partnership with Equiticity on a larger project of the mobility justice in Chicago and MPC, we set out to understand lived experience of structural racism in transportation. And just to give some context, these phases of research are more about understanding whether we're under uh, identifying the problems correctly than making a specific set of action steps. But we'll talk about the policy implications later on. So uh, as Audrey mentioned, Chicagoland is highly segregated, fifth nationally in fact, for combined racial and economic spatial segregation. This map shows the stark but nuanced racial divides in the city. Like residential segregation, jobs have distinct geographic patterns. And for those without a college degree, the vast majority of well compensated jobs are located outside of the city of Chicago and in the suburbs, which is important framing context for our findings, which I'll now transition into. So in this phase with job seekers and job coaches, we conducted 10 focus groups with 82 job seekers and five focus groups with 42 coaches. So this is common in qualitative work like ours to have a smaller set of participants with whom we go into greater depth. These sites uh, these focus groups were conducted at sites that do workforce development, like the one that Ron runs and will be telling us more about later on in the panel discussion. This map shows the sites of the focus groups and the zip codes where job seeker participants reside. The graph shows the racial composition of the job seekers. Most job seekers identified as Black, 78%, and the large majority did not have a four-year college degree, 81%. So we used what's called an inductive coding process. We did this in collaboration with Equiticity, MPC, and UIUC. This means instead of analyzing the transcriptions based on our predetermined categories, we let the transcriptions decide and determine our key analytic categories. So we coded the transcriptions line by line using these themes that we identified in the focus group findings. And the report details each of the findings around each of these codes and is available online. These codes then drove our cross-cutting findings and policy implications, which I'll now turn to in the interest of time. So it was clear from the focus groups that the burden of transportation is even larger than what we see with quantitative mapping tools. Respondents and job coaches describe lengthy commutes, often two hours of extra time because of part of that being transit reliability problems. So put simply, transportation is a significant time and financial burden. Those with disabilities who use transit had added challenges like broken elevators. As a result of unreliability, high temporal and financial costs of transportation, almost three quarters of job seekers reported that transportation was a barrier to keeping or finding a job. Respondents reported serious problems with the transit customer experience that included cleanliness, ease of transfers and fare payment, reliability, time burden, elevator maintenance, information and security. Simply put, enhancements for the transit customer experience are critical. If the transit customer experience is poor, workers may dismiss transit as an option, which hurts our ridership numbers and also hurts their job prospects. More funding for transit is needed to address the customer experience factors that the transit agencies directly control. But 
There are also needed partnerships to address numerous contextual factors that impact the customer experience but are outside the direct control of transit agencies. And one of these is security. Crime and violence were prominent themes and we want to flag that disinvestment in, and inequities across multiple social and policy realms have created these conditions. Findings demonstrate that analyses of workforce accessibility and transportation that do not account for security issues will overlook the constraints that respondents face around mobility, especially via transit and active modes like walking and biking. Individuals do adapt to security problems, like the quote, um, if you could go back one slide actually, um, about buying a car. Certainly automobile use has serious trade-offs, but getting rides, driving and ride hailing can be rational adaptations amid current realities. And uh, like equiticities work more broadly, we do not recommend increased policing given the documented racism in it and the criminal justice system. As a transportation study, we don't outline specific steps to address security and violence, but assert the need to partner with social justice movements, which are leading socially and racially just systems transformation to address violence. We can go to the, great. So respondents reported having to travel far outside their communities as reflected in this first quote, to access a greater share of the region's quality jobs. And many jobs are simply impossible to access for those without cars. There are multiple potential benefits, including but not limited to job access, from the development of quality jobs on the south and west sides and support of existing and new businesses. We envision a scenario in which a suburban commute is a choice rather than a necessity for quality employment. And respondents are quite cognizant of the inequitable geography of transportation services, as in the second quote. Participants noted several barriers to using active modes to get to work, including the great distances people have to travel in their home communities, which is different than some more affluent areas. Um, and the role of employers came up frequently. Um, Multiple respondents described how employers have hiring preferences based on applicants' addresses or transportation mode. They may ask questions about, quote, reliable transportation to gauge automobile access. Participants suggested the solution with the broadest benefit would be for employers to be closer to employees or at least locations with better transportation choices. Alternatively, employers could align work hours with transit schedules, connect to CTA hubs, or allow more scheduling flexibility. However, uh, many of us know employer-driven transportation support has been more common for high-wage workers. And we recognize right now there's a new economic and public health landscape. Nonetheless, we think policy actors can play an important role in making the case to employers that they too can benefit from supporting disadvantaged workers' transportation needs. And respondents identified transportation barriers that reflect long-standing inequitable investments and policies that have created and continue to create barriers to employment, especially on the south and west sides. One respondent called for reparations while others call for better quality jobs in close proximity. Addressing transportation challenges must involve non-transportation solutions, even as transportation improvements are vital. In short, solutions must be comprehensive and engage with communities in creating them. Now, Chelsea is gonna talk about our related work that tackled transportation beyond workforce issues in communities. Thanks, Kate. Um, so now I'll talk about phase two of the project, which focused a little bit more generally on community transportation issues. Um, so in phase two, we conducted 11 focus groups with 120 individuals. And you can see the sites and resident home zip codes here on the map. 68% um, of respondents identified as black, 27% as Latinx, and less than 3% as another racial or ethnic identity. 
Um, and as you can see in the graph on the left, most respondents reported an annual personal income of less than $20,000. Um, so we followed a similar method of collaborative and transcription-driven coding. Uh, the report is currently being finalized and is likely to be released next month. So um, you'll be able to read our detailed findings for each of these codes. Uh, right now, I'll focus a little bit more generally on the policy implications and the cross-cutting themes, uh, many of which overlap with some of the workforce findings. The respondents um, compared how moving around neighborhoods on the south and southwest sides differs from moving around on the north side. Um, some of these differences are conventionally defined as transportation problems, um, such as the lack of L train infrastructure on the far south and southwest sides, the absence of bicycle lanes or infrequent bus service, as well as missing sidewalks, um, noted by the respondent quoted here, um, and supported by CMAP sidewalk inventory. Um, so given these inequities, targeted investment is needed to focus on resolving these historic and current transportation disparities. Um, and respondents certainly wanted improved transportation systems, uh, but at the same time they highlighted how, you know, even if transportation inequities were resolved, black and brown communities would still be burdened with traveling further and longer to access essential goods and services with greater personal security concerns. Um, so this is why we conclude that violence prevention and local community and economic development, and not just infrastructure and service disparities, are all central transportation issues. Um, security concerns, including police violence, um, was a common topic. Um, and as stated, we don't recommend increased policing and defer to violence prevention social justice movements for um, identifying security interventions that would help improve transportation. Um, and as just one example of an alternative solution that was proposed by a respondent, uh, this respondent quoted here felt like local economic development could lead to improved security and might ultimately improve their transportation experience. Um, so because age, gender, disability, race, immigration status, language, and several other identity categories influence how people use transportation um, and the barriers they face while doing so, transportation issues must be understood from an intersectional perspective. Uh, transportation challenges and barriers that were very obvious to some of our participants because of their positionality uh, may be completely unknown to many transportation professionals. Um, so some frequently overlooked issues identified in this research include discriminatory policing, which was a barrier particularly for Black men, uh, and cost, a barrier particularly for folks on a fixed income. Uh, so the respondent quoted here explained how their identity informs their decision to drive um, because it offers them more control and security. Um, other respondents expressed a desire for more input and control over which transportation solutions are pursued in their communities uh, to ensure that they meet their needs. Um, respondents identified several burdens and costs for different transportation modes. Uh, so driving a personal vehicle or using ride hailing services had lower time costs and fewer security concerns, but high financial costs. Um, active modes presented lower financial costs, but high time costs and security concerns. And then public transportation had higher time costs and sometimes security concerns as well. Um, so these barriers not only lead to respondents seeing transportation as a burden and a source of stress, uh, but can also lead to suppressed trips. So ultimately, you know, this could mean fewer trips to the park with children, um, as in this quote, fewer trips to a full service grocery store for fresh produce, uh, and fewer trips to visit family and friends. Uh, respondents describe the individual adaptations they make to overcome their transportation barriers and propose different solutions for a variety of stakeholders. Um, so driving was, for many respondents, the preferred transportation mode. Uh, lowering the cost of a personal vehicle or of ride hailing services was identified as a solution um, that would immediately improve respondents' transportation experience by offering a greater sense of control over their mobility and reduced concern about exposure to violence. Um, supporting car use, as was said earlier, um, certainly runs counter to sustainability and traffic safety discourses, uh, but must be weighed against the other transportation barriers and associated consequences that low and moderate income black and brown communities face when considering adaptations in the immediate term, uh, even if our longer term solutions differ. Uh, many respondents also called for more community organizing and advocacy to identify common transportation issues and to hold elected officials accountable. Um, so greater investment in community organizing would give residents more capacity in advocating and negotiating with elected officials and transportation agencies 
to meet conventionally defined as well as broader transportation and access priorities. So to highlight just a few cross-cutting themes from both phases of the research, um, participants were cognizant of transportation and other inequities and had perspectives that are important for transportation stakeholders to understand. Um, Near-term adaptations need to recognize different challenges and perhaps user subsidies. Um, ultimately, there is a need for targeted investment across transportation modes, new decision making and community engagement processes, and holistic strategies that provide direct investment to address transportation inequities, but that also go much further to directly challenge structural racism and address these interlocking systems and experiences across policy arenas. Um, so partnerships in and beyond transportation will be critical for addressing mobility and racial justice. Thank you so much for listening. I look forward to the question and answer session. Thank you. Um, as I said earlier, I'm back to tell you a little bit more about my work at CNT. But last fall, CNT, Active Trans, and Equiticity came together to discuss how the inequities in the region's transportation system was continuing to deny black and brown communities access to opportunities, perpetuating racial wealth gaps, and the measured social determinants of health negative results. We schemed about how we could collectively begin to impact these disparities. So full disclosure before I go on, in addition to being on the staff at CNT, I am also on the board of Equiticity. Now, CNT aims to make cities work for everyone by creating sustainable and equitable communities. We work at the intersection of environmental sustainable, sustainability, social equity, and technology with particular attention on creating efficient and affordable solutions for low-income communities and communities of color. We do this by delivering game-changing research tools and solutions. Active Trans is an advocacy organization and a coalition of people working to make walking, biking, and public transit safe and equitable options for getting around Chicagoland. They aim to create healthy and sustainable and equitable communities by making walking, biking, and public transit safe, convenient, and fun. Equiticity is an equity movement of neighbors, organizers, advocates, activists, and researchers, all working collectively to use equity as a vehicle for social justice by transporting, transforming lives, neighborhoods, and cities for people of color, by programming and advocating for equity, mobility, and justice through online and offline platforms, through the streets of our neighborhoods, the corridors of power, and through cities across the U.S. So why 10 and why now? It was the election of equity for public officials like Mayor Lightfoot, the innovative transit fair and service change proposals from Cook County, and the significant technological changes to our transport system that motivated and emboldened us to organize 10. We knew that the solutions to inequity had to come from those being most impacted. We sent out invitations to organizations working on transportation and mobility justice issues. Our first convening was in December. Since then, we have been building a coalition of community groups, equitable transportation advocates, academics, and civic organizations who are willing to engage decision makers and challenge them to embed racial equity and mobility justice in transportation decision and investments. Ten net, TEN's network is composed of community-based organizations who represent communities that have suffered from inequitable transportation access or have been negatively impacted by past decisions. The advocates are those who can inspire the network to move towards equitable investments and improve outcomes by, while providing thought leadership along the way. The civic organizations are those who can support the network through communications, analytics, legislative activities, convenings, event organizations, and program delivery. It is black and brown people that hold the majority of leadership positions within the coalition. TEN has an ambitious but achievable set of goals. TEN plans to work towards long-term outcomes by increasing equitable community-driven investments. Our guiding goal is to reduce the racial wealth gap caused in part by inequitable transportation access. We will measure these 
outcomes by progress towards several goals. Reductions in transportation costs, improve access by residents to regional assets, improve access by local businesses to customers and suppliers, increase public sector investment in transportation infrastructure, but without displacement, reduction in air, air pollution, increase, increase healthy transportation choices, and others as identified by community residents. Ultimately, improvement in these measures will lead to increased private investment in historically marginalized communities, bringing about comprehensive community-driven investment. We launched 10 before the mobility justice research was completed. Now that it is, several 10 member organizations will develop policy recommendations based on the mobility justice in Chicago research findings grounded in their work in neighborhoods and our collective commitment to racial equity and mobility justice. In addition, Equiticity is seeking to execute a phase two of, mobility, of our mobility justice in Chicago research, focusing on a deeper quantitative analysis and a more intense and robust process for generating actionable transportation solution and racially equitably, equitable and just policy recommendations from, for, from black and brown transportation end users. Our immediate next steps for mobility justice in Chicago are publishing the report on our community-based focus group and potentially hosting an event to share the mobility, the totality of our mobility justice in Chicago research findings with the community. So stay tuned. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jackie, for that great explanation of the Transportation Equity Network. I am Audrey Wenink again um, from the Metropolitan Planning Council, and I am presenting on the Transportation Equity Performance Measures Research. So I'll quickly document the problem uh, a little bit more graphically, and then we'll get into the research. As you can see in this map that was developed by the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, Economically disconnected areas are shown in blue, defined as having populations with low income, high percentage of people of color, and populations of limited English proficiency. At the same time, it shows the top employment destinations in the region in gold, and you can see there's a major spatial mismatch. So what does this mean for transportation? Um, this map demonstrates some of the areas where the longest commutes exist and shortest commutes exist in this region, as well as the different population concentrations. In this region, communities where black residents are the largest racial group experience the longest commute times. Of the 100 census tracts with the longest commutes, which are 44 minutes each way, 95 are majority black or Latinx. The median income is $31,000. In contrast, the majority of the shortest commute tracts, 53 out of 100, are majority white. And the median income is over $75,000. So that's a real snapshot of the inequities. So as we began this research in partnership with Equiticity, a mobility justice organization, and university professors who specialize in transportation equity, we developed a working definition and then we use this as a framework through which to evaluate the transportation equity criteria that we evaluated. And so this, we have four points here. We were looking at um, equity in terms of the distribution of both benefits and burdens to communities with respect to transportation. The focus is on protecting and increasing benefits to communities that have higher needs. The focus is on allocating resources based on need. And then finally, providing opportunities for participation and influence on the transportation services that are in their communities and that will affect them. So let me talk a little bit about the overall methodology for this study. Basically, in a nutshell, we were looking at the 40 largest metropolitan areas and the MPOs there, and determining part one, if the MPOs were using performance-based planning and criteria to prioritize projects, 
And then part two, if they were, were they using equity as one of one or more of those criteria? Then once we had uh, that set of equity criteria, we classified them into categories and analyzed some of the pros and cons of those different methods. Before we get into those details, another important facet of this research is thinking about what, what do we mean by transportation benefits and burdens. So historically, we have concentrated mostly on benefits at the top of the benefits list, uh, which have historically been auto-oriented, focused on speed, congestion reduction, uh, and, and not as holistic as we would like to be. Uh, we have not focused on burdens typically early in the prioritization process. And this research has shown that it's important to be looking at both and the impacts on marginalized populations at the onset of transportation project development. Now let's talk briefly about what we mean by performance-based planning. It's a formalized process to ensure that the projects we spend public money on are delivering the most benefits for the dollar. The benefits that will get people where they need to go, that will increase the livability of communities, and will ensure that we're maintaining the systems that we have, uh, such as our roads, our sidewalks, our bike lanes, and trains and buses. And this is shown, I'll give you two examples uh, of what this means, you know, when we try to operationalize it. Uh, this is the Illinois Department of Transportation's value-driven project selection process, which they developed three years ago. What you can see here is, this is one of you know, many methods out there where you take criteria and apply them to projects based on different categories of what's important to a, a state or region and, and can do scoring. And then this helps you prioritize projects. Now, what we'll, we'll note is that this process was developed three years ago, but has not been consistently implemented. And um, of note for today's presentation, it does not include equity as one of the criteria. So uh, we are advocating that this process be used, but it be refined and that it include uh, criteria of equity. And then I'll give you a second example. This is from the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. Uh, the Chicago region's MPO. And don't get hung up on all the different uh, numbers and categories, but the point here is that this also has a scoring process and different categories. And I want to highlight that in ACWA, uh, the inclusive growth category is highlighted and that CMAP does use equity as a uh, criterion when allocating some of its federal funds, the Surface Transportation Program shared fund. Um, so this is just, just to give people a sense of like what we're talking about when we're talking about performance-based planning and, and criteria. So now let's talk about um, the results of the research. As I said, we looked at the top 40 MPOs, a um, little over half had available prioritization methodologies and um, a little fewer than that had an equity criterion. And we saw that the weightings were usually less than 10% of the overall score. When we looked at them, we found that we could categorize them into roughly five categories. The first four approaches used a spatial analysis, um, largely as a proxy for defining um, benefits or burdens to marginalized users. And then the last one is more user-based. So I'll, I'll get into them, I'll walk through them quickly and then um, to talk about a few of the pros and cons of each of the methods. So the first one, which was used by just a couple of the MPOs is burdens-based um, and location burdens-based method. And the, the, the key here is that the focus was on burdens and it acknowledges the potential negative impacts that transportation projects can have, especially in areas with high marginalized populations. It assumes these burdens based on the location. Um, and so it's, it's, it's good to acknowledge that burdens do occur and have occurred historically in marginalized communities, um, but it doesn't acknowledge the benefits of projects. So to, to use this in isolation, you would not be capturing the benefits. The next criterion is, is the benefits, uh, is the, the flip side of this. And um, 
most, uh, the majority of the MPOs that we found that had an equity criterion used some variation of this. So a benefits calculation that was typically developed uh, using um, some type of spatial measure and it basically assumes that benefits are uh, conferred when a project is in or adjacent to communities with marginalized populations and it does not measure burdens. The next one is, a, is sort of an enhancement to the location benefits version um, in that it, it, it would go beyond any kind of geographical proximity and gives a sense of the um, benefits in much more detail. It may look at a range of benefits and really analyze them, not just assume them, but analyze are choices being provided? Is there reduction in noise? Is there improved connectivity of networks, et cetera? So the score is, is calculated um, based on meaningful analysis of how benefits are conferred to marginalized populations. The fourth one is access to destination based. Um, this acknowledges access to key destinations as the most important benefit of a transportation system. And uh, so it, it can be done in a, in a couple different ways, such as access to jobs, um, improved travel times to destinations, um, you know, different, there's more than one specific way to calculate it, um, but it, it is positive from the standpoint that it's acknowledging that transportation's function is not just to go, to go fast, it's to go somewhere. Um, so it, so it, it helps make that connection. And then the final one is, user-based, and this is an example um, from CMAP. I think there are about three MPOs that use some variation of this. And in this case, um, CMAP uses its travel demand model to uh, determine how many people will actually use a proposed facility um, that are, in this case, they define it as people of color below the poverty line. And so um, this, is, this is a, a little bit more sophisticated in terms of really considering you know, who's going to use and benefit from a facility, not just what's, who lives next to it, et cetera. So um, I'm going to just summarize a few key findings, and then we can start getting into the Q&A. So don't forget, um, if, as questions are arising about Kate and Chelsea's presentation and about this one, uh, and also about Jackie's description of the Transportation Equity Network, please be listing their questions in the Q&A box. Uh, so back to the Q, back to the key findings for the MPO analysis. The um, we found that a few of the highlights are that the uh, the criteria were weighted fairly low, usually ten percent of the total. And so if we think about the scale of the problem in terms of the length of distances that people are traveling and the times that people are traveling in marginalized communities, uh, there is. If we really want to make changes, we're going to have to consider uh, increasing those weights. Uh, we noted that in a number of cases, MPOs only applied equity criteria to certain types of projects, like only to transit projects. Uh, and, and we would want equity to be considered for all types of transportation investments. Uh, most criteria did not concretely identify benefits. They, they assumed benefits based on proximity. Um, so it would be best if there were a detailed analysis of the specific benefits that would be conferred, as well as an under, under, understanding of what are the priorities for the populations in those communities. Uh, and then on this, the last one on this slide is that um, rarely did criteria consider burdens. And so uh, really we need to be looking at both benefits and burdens. So it's important that burdens be considered. And if a project has significant burdens, they should probably um, be calculated in the score as, as negative points. And then just a couple more points. Um, you know, want to note that marginalized populations, you know, comprise um, different racial and ethnic groups. So Black, Latinx, um, people with disabilities, um, potentially seniors or other categories. So it may be useful to break down the impacts on those different populations as a part of the process of developing the score because those uh, impacts could be different. And then finally, um, because there's such, been such a history 
of communities experiencing burdens and not having the ability to actively participate in the solutions for their communities. Uh, we would recommend some way of considering input from communities or at least community support for these types of projects. We didn't see any examples of that, but it's something that the industry should start to think about of, you know, how can we, especially for marginalized communities, which have has had such a history of suffering burdens. So I'll finish up by sharing with you um, resources. So on the left side is uh, a publication that's on our website. This is the final project um, done in partnership between our research assistant, Augustina Kropp and the MPC team. That's on our website. And then we also have a, a, an American Planning Association Planning Advisory Services memo that came out just a couple months ago, um, which you can access through a link on our website or you can um, contact me directly and, and be happy to share a PDF of that. So with that, we're going to um, stop looking at slides and um, start talking about, uh, you know, having a discussion with our panelists in terms of what you would like to um, you know, what, what we can glean from this research and what it means as we're moving forward. So we can have all of our panelists turn on their cameras and we can have everyone, um, everyone's beautiful faces on the screen. We can uh, have, our, have our conversation. So first, I'm gonna ask a few questions of the panelists um, to get the conversation going. And then we'll be taking a look in the Q&A box for any questions that uh, our participants have. So the first question uh, I have um, that is, is one that maybe would be appropriate for, for Kate or Jackie is um, while there's a great deal of quantitative research around transportation and equity that offers technical solutions, there's a lack of qualitative research as was pointed out by, by Kate in her presentation. Um, why do you think that is and is that, why is that a problem? Kate, do you want to go first or you want me to go first? I'm, I'm happy to start or let you okay. set the stage. Uh, go ahead, get started. Um, well, so I just messaged someone too. Um, Steve asked about mapping travel times, which we ha I shared a great tool a colleague puts out that's quantitative that I love. But we know there's a lot of work on quantitative analysis of transportation which is obviously important. But transportation planning has its roots in transportation modeling, which is tied to engineering and the predict and provide model earlier. Well, I guess it's not this century anymore, the 20th century, where the focus of transportation planning was modeling the future demand, predicting, and then providing roadway infrastructure. So transportation really has its roots in highway planning and quantitative models in the engineering domain. So that set the stage for the last several decades of transportation planning. And now we have powerful tools in GIS and big data, and those can help us understand transportation. But if we're not asking the right questions of those quantitative tools, we'll be missing important pieces of information. And that's why we need to talk to people directly who are experiencing transportation challenges. And I would argue that's the importance of qualitative work so that we have feedback to help us determine whether we're even asking the right questions of those powerful quantitative tools. And uh, we also know that the transportation workforce is not racially representative. It's not representative of people with disabilities, of different gender identities. So we also have to continue to work on diversifying transportation prof professionals because as Chelsea mentioned in her presentation, there are many problems that are obvious to those experiencing them that we might miss with powerful quantitative tools unless we know to use them to answer those questions. And I would just add on by saying that um, the, transporta the transportation sector, as with all sectors in our society, uh, is inflicted with uh, structural racism and implicit racial bias. 
And this is true both historically and within our contemporary context. Uh, the transportation sector has resisted efforts to operationalize racial equity and mobility justice frameworks. Consequently, transportation decision makers have not engaged in earnestly listening to and working with the broad spectrum of black and brown communities and other marginalized communities. Doing so would challenge and disrupt decades of transportation status quo. It's much easier to continue focusing on these quantitative analysis that you just mentioned, Kate, than to actively listen to marginalized end users of the transportation system. Only doing the easy things means not doing the job. Inaction on racial equity and mobility justice serves to strengthen embedded racism. This contributes to continued racialized transportation inequities, lack of mobility, perverse segregation, cyclical generational poverty, poor educational outcomes, limited access to preventive health services, and a dearth of hyperlocal economic development opportunities. So given the choice, qualitative is much better for racial equity analysis than quantitative. Thank you. That was that was great. Great couple of perspectives. Um, I wanted to just see uh, about the fact that many of the transportation burdens identified in the focus groups require non-transportation solutions. Um, so how can professionals and advocates who focus on transportation help to make progress in these areas? How should our approach change? I can speak to this one. Um, so some transportation professionals, uh, you know, might look at some of the burdens that respondents identified, you know, a lack of quality jobs on the south and southwest sides, racist policing, other personal security concerns, uh, child and family care work, among, you know, many others, uh, and think that they're just outside of the scope of their work. Um, and, you know, transportation professionals probably don't have the expertise to be designing the solutions to these issues. Uh, but these issues did directly impact uh, the way that respondents interact with the transportation system and the modes that they chose. Uh, so it's imperative for transportation professionals to recognize and address them anyway. Um, so transportation professionals can help make progress in these areas by following the lead of local um, community organizations and advocates who are already doing the work uh, and by offering their expertise uh, and their resources, including and maybe especially their financial resources um, to help grow and connect local efforts. Um, so ultimately, this kind of approach uh, is going to be more perceptive to local challenges and assets. Uh, it's going to have more success uh, at addressing the challenges through trusted community organizations. Um, we can build the capacity of all the stakeholders involved to uh, continue to make these connections between issues that are um, so often siloed in policy discussions. Great, thank you. Yeah, we need to we need to be partnering a lot more. Is what we're what we're learning, I think. Um, so uh, now let's talk a little bit. I'd like to hear from um, from Ron because he has such he has such rich experience working with job seekers. Um, Transportation is a means for accessing opportunity, but frequently we're asking the transportation system to solve for not enough nearby opportunities. Is that a separate problem? Uh, yes, um, at the workforce centers, uh, sometimes it's, it's difficult. Uh, many of our customers do come to us and they have transportation challenges. Uh, quite a few don't have cars. Uh, the workforce centers are um, sometimes overburdened with the request for supportive services. Uh, we provide uh, bus passes. Uh, we try to link up um, the suburban bus system, uh, the PACE bus system. Uh, we try to make sure that our customers have access to transportation, but oftentimes, some, uh, you know, they have to tra uh, travel past their homes, past areas that might not be uh, the most conducive for, for the, those customers. So um, our challenge is sometimes we run out of funding. Our customers 
don't always uh, receive the bus passes. And when that happens, they have to rely on other resources to try to identify um, funding for those bus passes. Um, most times we can cover the need, but oftentimes it comes down to once we've depleted those resources, uh, sometimes we have to lean on community based organizations as partners to assist us uh, with those uh, transportation needs. So when the travel, uh, when the funds are exhausted, sometimes we have to lean on other resources uh, for our customers. So that can be a problem uh, when they have to travel uh, long distances, that uh, is a problem. What we try to do as a workforce center is identify uh, opportunities, job orders that don't require them, them to travel as far. And that does help out sometimes. Uh, and we rely on our system. The Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership uh, has business services representatives across all of the American job centers, all of the workforce centers. So we sometimes have to uh, pull those job orders and identify opportunities that are closer for our customers to uh, take advantage of. Thanks, Ron. I don't know if Kate, did, did you have any, any, uh, anything to add on that one about um, how transportation is being asked to solve for not enough nearby opportunities? Well, I think uh, Ron and Chelsea have both implicitly spoken to that a little bit. I, the goal of, of transportation is not just movement, it's connecting to destinations and opportunities. So if we share that as a goal for transportation systems, it's imperative to work in partnership uh, with other organizations who are doing the work and build capacity to get people to opportunities. And that um, relates a little bit to a question that I see Steve Schlickman asked in the Q&A. Uh, yes, the access to jobs is absolutely a transportation equity issue and a housing equity issue. Uh, traditional responses to the spatial mismatch have been job development in the urban core, affordable suburban housing and transportation solutions. We think all of those have benefits and uh, low and moderate income households should absolutely have housing options in the suburbs, but that there shouldn't have to be a moving to the suburbs for quality jobs. There should be an investment that gives people opportunities in their existing communities as well. So I, concur these are not just transportation equity issues but we have to keep our eyes on the goal of access to opportunity as being the ultimate hope and vision uh, for transportation. Thank you. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about spatial mismatch you know because we are we are dealing with both a land use and transportation problem in this region and, and many regions which is the source of of source of the consternation. Uh, Jackie, can you tell us kind of a little bit more of your perspective on how the spatial mismatch between communities with affordable housing and areas with job opportunities impact people's ability to find and retain employment? So um, building off what uh, Kate uh, just ended her last comment with about uh, the spatial mis mismatch, um, we know that uh, communities with significant quantities of affordable housing are most often low to moderate income and predominantly black and brown communities. Um, these communities are, are already struggling with a full range of inequities and experiencing a full range of racial injustices. Four of the five major job centers are concentrated in the north and west outer suburbs a significant distance from communities of color. Uh, these locations require long commute times by car or by transit. Um, as a result, um, one of the things that we know is that our, our regional uh, transportation system is not designed to move low and moderate income workers from these affordable housing communities to those outlying job centers or for second and third shifts um, really either out there or right here in the city. Um, as you heard during our focus groups uh, for this research, 
we learned of the many transportation barriers facing job seekers. We also learned of the challenges with retaining employment when our transit system is unreliable and or disconnected. These factors and many other related factors compel low-income workers to own a vehicle resulting in spending a significant portion of their already limited income on transportation. CNT has done extensive research on the housing plus jobs transportation affordability uh, problems. So if you'd like to see more or learn more, you can visit our website at cnt.org. Thank you. And let's talk a little bit more um, about, you know, the experience, Ron, you're having in your workforce development centers to overcome transportation barriers to employment. What are the additional supports you need as you're on the front lines working with individuals who are trying to become employed and stay employed? How can we help? Well, you know, I mentioned earlier that uh, we don't have an unlimited amount of uh, supportive services for the customers. So we rely on uh, community-based organizations that are close by to sometimes assist us with the transportation needs. Um, a project that we are very heavily involved in in the Austin community, uh, we've had a couple organizations to actually go out and purchase vans. And uh, those vans take take groups of workers out to jobs that are in the uh, uh, southern suburbs, um, like Bolingbrook area. Um, so we've actually relied on those CBOs to actually assist us. They purchase vans and they can take up to a dozen workers and they take these workers to uh, work two or three different shifts. So organizations that partner with those types of resources are able to help us with some of our needs. So, and then we also work with uh, the ride sharing groups, uh, Lyft, um, we work with uh, Uber. Um, we actually have done a lot of hiring for those organizations. So they help out with some of the transportation needs. So the centers have their own limited supply of bus passes. We also uh, provide gas cards. We work with CBOs uh, who can also provide vans, additional gas cards. We work with the, the Department of Family and Support Services who also provide the uh, gas cards when we have exhausted our own supply. So those are just some of the resources and some of the um, ways that our community-based partners are actually helping to assist us when we need that assistance and then the ride sharing. So we're using a, a myriad of different methods to, um, to kind of uh, supplement our own transportation needs. Great, thank you. That's, that's really helpful. Those specific examples really shed light on kind of how people are trying to solve these problems, um, trying, to be, trying to be innovative. Um, now, many transportation planners uh, are continuing to try to move transportation choices to be more sustainable um, and more affordable. Uh, however, many of the focus group participants state a preference for driving, even in areas where there's good transit service, and even though owning a car is a significant financial burden. Can you talk a little bit more about that, Chelsea? Yeah, um, so many respondents uh, preferred driving or even ride hailing services uh, because it offered them a greater sense of control over their mobility. Um, they felt that it reduced their exposure to violence um, and it was most convenient and comfortable for doing activities like grocery shopping or traveling with kids uh, or with a passenger with mobility challenges. Um, and, you know, of course, increasing car use has equity and safety, livability, sustainability trade-offs. Um, but, you know, until the Chicago region is able to address the structural racism in our transportation system that keeps South and Southwest side communities inequitably burdened, um, individuals are just going to, you know, continue to use driving and ride hailing as a rational adaptation to overcome their transportation barriers. Um, and so we need to make sure policy interventions, um, at least in part, focus on user subsidies to support these folks. 
Thanks, Chelsea. So we've, hear, we've heard a lot about um, these inequitable status quo situations that have been going on for quite some time. Um, and our local governments and agencies play a role in maintaining those, th this situation, but they can also play a role in creating a more equitable system. How uh, do you think we can be influencing these institutions to change? How can we speed up change? Uh, Jackie, maybe you'd like to tackle that one. Um, first, uh, let's lay the necessary groundwork here. Uh, we all know that institutional change moves at a glacial speed, even under the best of conditions. Uh, operationalizing racial equity and mobility justice within our regional transportation system can be seen almost as a tectonic shift away from racially inequitable status quo and towards a fair just system of transportation which prioritizes black, brown, and LMI communities. So using my equiticity hat, I would say that equiticity's vision for operationalizing racial equity and mobility justice, as well as institutionalizing systemic change, is made up of four interconnected components. Uh, community power building, research, advocacy, policy. And community building, uh, power building, is a work to inspire black and brown people to recognize the power they already inherently possess to transform their neighborhoods and improve their lives. Research is the work to better understand the severity of the problem and develop solutions in full partnership with the, with the people most adversely impacted. Advocacy is a work to convince policymakers and budget holders that the transportation status quo is deadly for marginalized communities. These keepers of the status quo must be inspired or if need be, have a rocket engine launch the symbolic transportation glacier into the present day in order to expedite this tectonic shift. Policy is a work to take a full-throated, comprehensive, and authentic commitment to racial equity and mobility justice out of the hands of well-meaning people who come and go from institutions. Policy is a work of institutionalizing and operational commitment to these frameworks in a manner which is all parts accountable, mathematical, directional, and outcome driven. So equity is four components of community building, again, research, advocacy, and, and policy are all interconnected and are all fluid levers we must constantly adjust in real time in order to affect systemic change as quickly as possible. Change is so slow because it is going against centuries of embedded institutional racism and a calcified status quo which are both protected by people, policies, and laws. We speed it up by being here today, by executing our mobility justice in Chicago research, by mobilizing people in neighborhoods, by setting forth the equity, racial equity statement of principle, launching the transportation equity network, and all of the work we are doing distinctly and collaboratively. Thanks, Jackie. So we'll just do maybe one or, or two more questions and then we'll get into the um, participant questions. Um, Ron or, or Chelsea, we, we, we got some sense from the qualitative research about how many balls people are juggling in their daily lives and what trade-offs they're making to consider job opportunities vis-a-vis -vis the other complications um, that exist in people's daily lives. Um, Maybe, maybe Ron first, can you talk a little bit about the trade-offs that people are making as they're trying to become gainfully employed, but also have to maintain uh, family life and other responsibilities? Um, basically, what our customers are telling us, uh, telling our career coaches, our business services consultants, um, is that it's definitely uh, difficult. Um, I'll point out one story of uh, how we uh, 
uh, were serving individuals in the uh, North Lawndale community. Um, we basically had, um, we were working with uh, a church over there and uh, we, because they were complaining about some of the transportation issues, we decided to go to the church and conduct on-site orientations, help them learn about the program, uh, try to get them enrolled as soon as possible. Um, so we completed the orientation, the intake. Uh, we did some um, tape testing, um, measuring the reading and math skills uh, in case that some training was necessary. But when it was time to actually come in and complete the last step of the registration process, our customers or these candidates for registration um, refused to come to the center uh, because they didn't want to cross gang lines. Uh, that was probably one of uh, the most uh, alarming issues that we've, we've seen um, that they pass up on these employment opportunities that we had identified. We had uh, gone out, developed these job orders, and all they had to do was just to come in to complete the last step for registration, but they did not want to cross the gang lines between North Lawndale and where we're located, which is East Garfield. So that was um, probably the most alarming uh, and eye-opening um, experience we've had uh, in terms of individuals who just uh, bypass the employment opportunities. These were employment opportunities that we had set up with employers that involved on the job training, where we were going to reimburse the employer 50% of their wages. And this would have been over a uh, 16 week period. So it was guaranteed employment we were going to reimburse the employer and based on their performance, they would have uh, potentially been kept on uh, for these employment opportunities. So uh, those are just some of uh, the trade-offs that we've been able to see um, with our feet on the ground here. Thanks, Ron. Those are, those are very illustrative uh, stories about um, you know, what, what it's like uh, for people in their daily life and the choices they have to make. Um, so we've gotten a number of uh, interesting questions here from in the Q&A, uh, so please feel free to, to continue to add to that. Um, see one question for um, Kate and for Chelsea. Did the research offer any perspective on the debate between prioritizing lowering transit cost and improving the reliability and frequency of transit? So kind of financial costs and time costs. Um, any insights there on transit? Um, Chelsea, do you want to start or would you like me to? You can go ahead. Um, so I think as qualitative work, we identified themes and explored understanding. We didn't conduct a survey that posed this question to respondents of if you had to choose one or the other. And my sense based on our on the qualitative work is that that those needs would really vary by individual. Um, even for moderate income individuals, I think many moderate income individuals might prefer service improvements, but that powerful quote that Chelsea identified in her presentation showed that the cost of transit fare was suppressing trips. So that means uh, disadvantaged folks, especially brown and black individuals and households on the south and west sides are missing out on important economic, health, and civic activities. So I guess I would say we need to choose an alternate model in which improvements in transit service are not pitted against uh, fare relief for those who need it. So I, I think uh, means-tested fare relief is one important strategy to uh, bypass that dichotomy. 
I think Kate put it very well. Yeah. I think um, it just sort of depends on uh, the individual whether they would prefer one or the other, but uh, it doesn't mean we can't pursue both simultaneously. Great. Um, there's a question here that uh, maybe would be good for Jackie since she's got such decades of experience in transit advocacy. Um, to the extent that we have started to do more performance-based assessments in our region, the evaluations seem to only apply to capital investments, which may be okay for walking and biking and car, and car investments because it could be assumed that access is at the user's discretion. However, for transit, just like, we, this, like this previous question alludes to, service availability and frequency is, um, is a key part of it. And it depends on operations funding, not just capital investments. If the, for example, if the bus is infrequent or doesn't run on weekends or doesn't run late at night, doesn't matter how nice the bus stop is. So um, is there an opportunity to, to apply performance criteria to allocate operations resources for transit and not just capital investment? Any thoughts, Jackie? Yeah, I, I think it's possible to to do that. Uh, the problem that we have uh, is that, you know, capital usually comes up first because we have federal funds that we get in the region, in the city and the region for capital improvement. So, you know, we can look at the federal transportation legislation and we about know how much capital money is coming into, into the CTA, Pace and Metro. On the other hand, um, we don't get any federal support for operations. So operations have to be funded locally. So operation is funded by the fare box. Uh, operations uh, is funded by you know, all of those ads you see on the platform and on the trains. Uh, it is funded by the sales tax uh, that we pay uh, in, the, in the region. So, so those local funds uh, have to provide the support for operations. So yes, we can come up with criteria that um, can help us see whether or not it's performing to some goals uh, for, um, for performance, but at the same time, we have to consider if there's funding available. So I am a big proponent. Uh, so if I put my policy hat on, a big performance for getting, and we used to, I mean, that the case this was uh, something new um, in the last um, 15, 20 years. I can't remember exactly when operational funding was ceased, but you know, we used to get operational funding and for our regional transportation agencies, but we don't anymore. And you know, as we look at the way federal funds for transportation is distributed, you know, highways always come out on top and transit is also kind of, I think of it as an also ran. Um, so, so there is no reason, given the impact of climate change we have these days, that we know that you know it is an existential question as to whether or not we'll even have a planet, that we need to change the funding mechanism in Washington so that we have more money for alternative modes of transportation or less polluting modes of transportation, rather than continue to invest in, in highways and 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 favoring automobile transportation over transit, biking, and walking. Um, so the short answer is that yes, we can have performance measures, but two, uh, we need to have the funds that we can address those issues of more frequent buses, more frequent trains, more uh, lighted bus stops, more sidewalks, et cetera. So, you know, it's kind of like chicken and egg. Uh, I say we need to have both because I like omelets. Thanks, Jackie. Um, and it, there's a comment here that's that's a little bit related. I'll, I'll just mention um, the the Regional Transportation Authority that oversees CTA Metro and Pace has just developed a new framework for transit capital investments that came out yesterday, and it's open for public comment right now. So that doesn't answer the operations question. Um, but just for all of you on the call that are interested in these things, uh, it's open for public comment right now, and. Uh, take a look and there may be opportunities to insert equity into this um, process as it's being revised. Um, there's a question here um, for Ron about how has uh, COVID-19 affected his work um, in, in working with um, people that are seeking jobs and um, you know, both from a transportation standpoint 
uh, and uh, just generally. So could you comment on that, Ron? Yeah, um, I'm actually in the process of finalizing a reopening plan for the West Side American Job Center uh, and a startup plan for the Chatham Center, uh, you know, on the south and west sides. As a result of that, our funder and uh, my employer, KRA, has required that we re review all of the Center for Disease Control's policies on public health, social distancing, and operational guidance. Um, without going over that entire document, uh, we basically had to um, actually implement uh, social distancing stickers on the floor requiring six feet between everyone. We've installed uh, sneeze guards at the front counters. Um, the workforce centers or American job centers have always uh, been open access for everyone to just come in. Uh, now we have to um, have someone at the door. Um, we'll have to ask questions, uh, use non-contact thermometers. Um, most of our services are going to be virtual. Uh, so these are just some of the changes. These are the new normal uh, that we'll be dealing with. Um, we'll be requiring uh, private office space if there is a need for one-on-one -on -one meeting and social distancing it within that office. So it will be uh, very difficult. Everyone will have to wear uh, the uh, face mask. Um, we'll be providing uh, the disposable face masks. We'll be providing the hand sanitizers. Um, we'll be checking not only the customers, but staff as they come into the centers. Uh, the ride sharing, it'll be one person and then um, somehow we're going to have to uh, monitor all of those processes to make sure that social distancing is being um, honored. So yeah, it's a new normal. Um, things are going to be a little bit different. And we've already started all of that. Uh, stocking up on supplies of PPE. Uh, my office is, is like a uh, inventory at a uh, uh, at a clinic or something. So, so yeah, it's been um, a new normal for all of us. Thanks for helping us understand that. Um, a question is in here, and I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on this. Uh, maybe, maybe Jackie or, or Kate. Uh, there are some new rules and procedures on the table uh, under the Trump administration to streamline uh, the NEPA process to build infrastructure, the attention, I believe, to build infrastructure more quickly. Um, do you have concerns that it, this could result in silencing the voices of otherwise marginalized populations? Yes, <laughs> short answer. <laughs> um, you know, the, um, the environmental uh, protection uh, were put in place for reasons, uh, as I was just, you know, saying earlier is that, you know, we are now at this, this inflection point of climate change. You know, do we start, I think we have like, what, nine years before we get to a point of no return. Uh, and this is the wrong time to be easing I, uh, environmental uh, assessments for projects, projects that are polluting projects that can impact our climate. Um, and, and, and so that's at the, at the broad level. At the individual community uh, equitable um, uh, uh, users of, of the transportation system and people who live in this environment, it absolutely silences their voices. You know, this is all meant to, to say that let's rush through this, let's do some checking off of the boxes to to satisfy, you know, those those nerdy little uh, annoying questions about whether or not we've done it right, uh, and to not hear from the communities. You know, so so you know, I can remember, you know, as a as a kid, I go back that far when the Dan Ryan was being laid out, and the only thing we knew that was happening 
and that, you know, the Dan Ryan was coming through is that there are these stakes in the ground with orange flags on them. Um, so we had no chance, uh, or at least the, yeah, my parents didn't know at the time that we were getting, you know, the community was going to be impacted uh, by having, you know, this great big trench dug through the middle of communities that some of my classmates who were on the wrong side of, of the Dan Ryan had no easy way to getting to, to our school. So, you know, those are, you know, just kind of like a, 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 a small example of the impact of transportation projects can have. Uh, you know, so whether or not it's physically distancing that we're supposed to be doing now for our health, but physical distancing in terms of the way it impacts uh, co community cohesion, as well as the impact it has on the environment, that this is absolutely wrong time to be going in that direction. I don't know, Kate, I talked too much. You want to add anything uh, to that? Um, uh, well, I absolutely share your concern. Um, Jackie brought up, up the building of interstates, and that was prior to the passage of the NEPA Act, which this question references. Um, I would, and the National Environmental Policy Act has been really critical in meaning that there's more public information and more processes, and there's a mandate around doing environmental justice analyses in reference to the Civil Rights Act, Title VI. NEPA is not enough. NEPA doesn't actually mean that we have equitable air quality as Jose's question in the Q&A brought up. We know black and brown communities experience negative air pollution effects from the way transportation has unfolded. So both in terms of global climate change and the dramatic environmental harms from transportation, NEPA has given us levers. It has increased knowledge, but sometimes it's done just as check the box and people don't even know uh, still with the protections that have been in place of what is around the corner in their communities. So I'm very concerned that a process that has been important, but um, not sufficient is being rolled back further. All right, well, I'm just looking at the clock and I don't think we have time for any more questions. We're, we're just about at the end. Uh, this time has gone so quickly. So we didn't, we didn't get uh, to all the questions, but there were a lot of really good ones and our panelists had such great insights. So I just wanna thank you all again, Jackie Grimshaw, Chelsea Corin, Ron Hearns, and Kate Lowe for being with us today for all your work on all this research over the past couple of years. Um, thank again the Chicago Community Trust for the funding that supported this research. And I'm sure all of us would be happy to answer questions offline um, separately if there are additional conversations people would like to have. This is the, this is the beginning, not the end of the conversation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, virtual round of applause and um, have a great rest of your day.